Uh, okay, Whitehead's book, Science and the Modern World. It's not his major piece. Um, it's not a statement of his developed metaphysics, uh, except uh, in terms of certain segments of it towards the end, when um, those ideas do come out in a highly condensed form that is very difficult to understand if you haven't read the larger work, um, Process of Reality. Uh, I'm referring to chapters 9 and 10, which uh, I did not assign for that very reason. They're very hard to understand. Um, but uh, I, I've asked you to read this book um, for the primary reason that while it introduces Whitehead, um, it does so in historical terms. Uh, as you've discovered, the first uh, seven or eight chapters are about the historical uh, relationship of science to philosophy. Uh, so that really it's an account of science in the modern world in relationship to modern philosophy. And uh, as such, I think, is extremely helpful because, um, as I'm sure you've observed, it's just impossible to talk about the history of philosophy without talking about the history of science. And so um, this provides some help in that regard. Um, he sees philosophy as having a twofold task. He states this explicitly in the introduction to Process and Reality, his systematic work, the twofold task of philosophy. There is a critical task, and there is a speculative task. Now, that's the case um, with philosophy generally in any regard. Criticism of speculative ideas. Uh, criticism of theoretical constructs. Uh, to see if they are coherent, consistent, empirically adequate. And incidentally, those are the criteria he always works with. Empirical adequacy. Does it cover all relevant information? Empirical adequacy. And rational coherence. Not just logically consistent. But does it provide a unified and comprehensive scheme? Coherence. So um, critiquing is one of the things. And in relationship to the history of science, it's the critiquing of scientific abstractions. The critiquing of scientific abstractions. And you see that at work in the first uh, four or five chapters of the book. He's critiquing the theoretical abstractions of um, mechanistic science, what he calls mechanistic philosophy. Um, the second speculative function, of course, is uh, the positive function of philosophy. Uh, to propose a more consistent, more empirically adequate uh, speculative theories. Extrapolating. Now, these um, two functions of philosophy are very characteristic of uh, the way in which philosophers describe what they're doing, whether an introduction to philosophy texts or whatever, uh, for the first um, three decades of this century. 1900 to 1930, 1935, uh, this is the way it was. Um, what happened after 1935? The rise of logical positivism. Uh, therefore, with a rejection of metaphysical speculation. And so only the first function remained, which gradually came to be spoken of as the analytic function, and so analytic philosophy. Uh, the analysis of arguments and concepts and theories for their logical structure. And empirical adequacy. Yes, but with the demise of um, logical positivism, and all we have now is its vague ghost lurking behind in other disciplines than philosophy, it's died out in philosophy. Um, with the demise of logical positivism, speculative metaphysics is now alive and well. And um, some of you, I don't know if any of you are, but um, some of you or your colleagues are taking a seminar this uh, quad on contemporary metaphysics. Very contemporary. Yes, but in any case, um, this is the way philosophy was conceived in those early decades of this century. Um, now, as you read into this, this book, Science and the Modern World, um, the first note that strikes you in that uh, beginning chapter is what he calls the basic presumption of science, the basic presupposition of science, which he calls the order of nature, the order of nature. In the second chapter, it turns out that he's discussing the mathematical order of nature, because it was the rise of modern mathematics uh, that was particularly significant in the um, 17th century, particularly. So the order of nature. You, uh, you notice, I hope, that while he calls it a mathematical order, or if you like, a logical order, he also calls it an aesthetic order. Keep that in mind. Uh, as I mentioned last time, he seems to have an aesthetic theory of value. That is to say, all values seem ultimately to reduce to aesthetic values. Truth is valued for its aesthetic satisfaction. Um, goodness, moral value, uh, contributes to the aesthetic harmony of the whole. It's important for that reason. Uh, so he has an aesthetic theory of value. So he's saying, in a sense, that this is a value-laden order of nature. The values are not simply uh, utilitarian. Usefulness of things. Um, value is not something that we create and add, bring to nature. Nature itself is value laden. And so he speaks of the aesthetic order as being an ideal for the future. As much as this is a process philosophy, the process is directional. Uh, what direction? To the achievement of value, that ideal. You see. So it is a value achieving process laden with the possibility, the potential, but a value-achieving process, a teleological process. And it, it's that notion of um, a value-achieving natural order that makes Whitehead so revolutionary in comparison with modern science and earlier philosophy. A value-achieving natural order. So uh, you can anticipate then that the general theme of the book will be to critique the kind of supposed natural order which is value-free, bare, blind fact, blind process, 
causal mechanism without rhyme or reason. You see? He's going to be critiquing that and at the same time uh, tracing the developing case for um, the kind of teleological view that he has. Now, in both the critical and the speculative function, um, he has not only um, sort of criteria for judgment in terms of empirical adequacy and rational coherence, he has those, but he has two points of reference. If you're talking of empirical adequacy, what sorts of experience are most significant? And um, his points of reference are, of course, um, uh, developments in modern science. But he's perfectly aware that modern science is simply dealing with further scientific abstractions. You see, what makes the abstractions of modern science any better than the abstractions of mechanistic science? So it's not simply modern science. Uh, the uh, other point of reference is what again and again naive experience, concrete experience. And um, that comes out in the kind of example that we were using in um, explaining uh, his conception of the event, where the example was simply the, uh, the concrete experience of perceiving, a perceptual event, uh, where his phenomenological description, yeah, you see Hegel's phenomenology, his phenomenological description of a self-conscious perceptual event, no, of a perceptual event in a self-conscious being, <laughs> uh, is the, uh, the lens through which he is able to see everything else. You see, that's the paradigm, switch the metaphor. And that's a case of concrete experience. And you'll find that again and again he recurs to concrete experience. That is why he has that delightful chapter on the romantic reaction that's loaded with poetry. You see? Because he takes it that um, the poetry is dealing with concrete human experience, not with theoretical abstraction, you see. But it's capturing the experience. And so he takes it that the romantic poets like Wordsworth and Shelley are reacting against that um, aesthetically sterile universe of mechanistic science. So his chapter is called The Romantic Reaction. Reaction against what? Well, it's the reaction against the sterility of that mechanistic worldview from the standpoint of what the romantics regard as concrete human experience. Whitehead with them. So um, if you think that um, romanticism died out in the 19th century, well, not in the case of Whitehead. Um, not in the case of a lot of others as well. Uh, but um, uh, this comes through very plainly. Now, let me um, illustrate that um, general tale that I, I've been telling. Uh, turn, if you will, to page 18 in the, uh, in the book, page 18. Um, incidentally, he, uh, he speaks in one place uh, of Christianity as a religion in search of a metaphysics. A religion in search of a metaphysics. Uh, what he means is that the metaphysical systems uh, which have been pressed into service are inadequate. Um, what Christianity needs is a more adequate metaphysic. Um, and I, I think that uh, granted his conception of Christianity, which you remember is that of the Galilean peasant. Remember that phrase? It's the Galilean Jesus. And granted that conception of Christianity, he sees his metaphysic as a metaphysic for which Christian religion may be looking, you see, which may account for the process theology that has come out of it. But in any case, um, look at page 17. Did I say 17? Well, I'm saying 17 now anyway. Uh, okay. Um, about a third of the way down the page. There persists throughout the whole period, and he's talking about 16th, 17th century, the fixed scientific cosmology, which presupposes the ultimate fact of an irreducible root matter. Irreducible root matter. That's stuff. Something. You know not what. Okay. Spread throughout space in a flux of configurations. In itself, such material is senseless, that is to say unconscious, valueless, purposeless. Okay. It just does what it does, following a fixed routine imposed by external relations which don't spring from the nature of its being. That um, phrase, external relations, watch. Because an external relationship between A and B, as he says, does not spring from the nature of a thing's being. In other words, there are artificial relationships imposed on A and B. Incidental, which leave A and B essentially the same as they were before. The classic example of that is Descartes' mind-body relationship. So the mind is a separate entity with its own function entirely separate from, and able to function quite independently of, body with its mechanical functions. Uh, so external relations. He's going to be arguing for internal relations, which obviously are the opposite of external relations. So internal relations are relationships that um, pertain by virtue of the essential nature of A and B. You see, A has to be defined in terms of its relationships. That's what constitutes A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what constitutes a servant, a servant, or a master, a master? You've heard of a master servant relation, you? you see. What constitutes a servant, a servant, or a master, a master? But the relationship. You see. So he's picking up on Hegel's conception of internal relationships within a process. And he's going to be, as he says, um, transferring that into a naturalistic context. Okay, uh, external relations. It's this assumption of a valueless, purposeless, senseless matter following a fixed routine imposed by external relations, the mechanistic universe. It's this that I call scientific materialism. It's an assumption I'll challenge as being entirely unsuited to the scientific situation in which we now arrive. And you find that he um, immediately goes on to indict Descartes. Well, turn over to page 18, and halfway through the page you have this. Uh, a little over halfway through the page. The faith in the order of nature which has made possible the growth of science, is a particular example of a deeper faith. This faith in the order of nature cannot be justified by inductive generalization. Why not? Well, you remember Hume's problem with induction? 
you think? That inductive generalization beyond present experience involves the principle of causation of which we have no empirical evidence. Well, he's going to come back to that later on. He anticipates it here. That faith in the order of nature cannot be justified by any inductive generalization. It springs from direct inspection of the nature of things disclosed in our immediate present experience, concrete experience. That's where we get the idea of an order in nature. The fact that day succeeds day, that your roommate is relentlessly the same, and so forth. There's no parting from your own shadow. It's there all the time. I am I. To experience this faith is to know that in being ourselves, we are more than ourselves. To know that our experience, dim and fragmentary as it is, yet sounds the utmost depths of reality. To know that detached details, merely in order to be themselves, demand that they should find themselves in a system of things. To know that this system includes the harmony of logical rationality, the order of nature, the harmony of aesthetic achievement, there's that value achievement. To know that while the harmony of logic lies upon the universe as an iron necessity, the aesthetic harmony stands before it as a living ideal, molding the general flux in its broken progress towards finer subtler issues. Hey, he waxes eloquent from time to time. <laughs> Indeed he does. Um, Okay, uh, 50, page 54, flash on to that, and uh, you get it again. Uh, almost halfway through the page, in the context, he's talking about Newton's physics, okay? And about Locke, who's writing with a knowledge of Newton's physics. He says, but the mind, in apprehending experience, in apprehending, also experiences sensations which, probably speaking, are qualities of mind only. These sensations are projected by the mind so as to clothe appropriate bodies in external nature. Secondary qualities are subjective. Okay? Thus, the bodies are perceived as with qualities which, in reality, don't belong to them. Qualities which are, in fact, uh, purely the offspring of the mind. Thus, nature gets credit that should, in truth, be reserved for ourselves. Isn't that a cute way to put it? The rose gets credit for its scent, the nightingale for its song, and the sun for its radiance. But according to Locke and the Newtonian tradition, the poets are entirely mistaken. Uh, no, according to Whitehead, the poets are mistaken. They should address their lyrics to themselves and should turn them into odes of self-congratulation on the excellency of the human mind. Because nature is a dull affair, soundless, scentless, colorless, merely the hurrying of material, endlessly, meaninglessly. Okay. You see, uh, he's talking here of aesthetic values. Nature is devoid of all aesthetic value, if secondary qualities, the aesthetic qualities, color, smell, sound, if aesthetic qualities are subjective, yes, then the world in itself has no aesthetic value. Yes, Doesn't have any color, smell, shape. Yes, and since you cook up the world of that by projecting your secondary qualities, you should congratulate the cook. Congratulate yourself. Okay. Um, that, that couldn't be uh, uh, much more plain than that. Well, you'll see that all the way through. Um, that sort of thing, I'll come back to it later. Okay, in chapter two, the chapter on mathematics, um, mathematics and the history of thought. Um, he talks about the order of nature. And of course, in the Platonic and Pythagorean tradition, that was conceived to be a mathematical order, as it was in Descartes and much of modern science. Uh, that's why a theoretical physicist I got to know a few years ago did his work with the slide rule. Physics with the slide rule. Yes, because nature has a mathematical order. Yes, I don't know if he does it with the slide rule now. I suspect not. He's probably dead long since. But um, even if he were alive, I suspect it would be um, some other computer than the slide rule. Uh, but um, this notion of a mathematical order, of course, is what in the Greek tradition underlay the theory of forms, real universals. So that what you have is a notion of um, uh, an eternal um, range of um, order, an eternal mathematical order, an eternal logical order. Whereas the, uh, the things in this world have only vibratory existence. That's his phrase, vibratory existence. Uh, meaning that they come and go vibratory existence. Um, and, and you can get that in various ways. Um, you'll find him talking about it in um, talking of John Locke's notion of simple ideas. That is to say, atomistic ideas. Uh, so that those constituents of this so-called experience that John Locke talks about can't be, be, be disconnected and we have to associate them with the psychological principles of association. Yes, Combining and separating ideas according to their resemblance, contiguity, whatever it is. What you get is an atomistic view of experience analogous to the atomistic view of the material world in the mechanistic scheme. 